always said growing up as an amateur fighter that I would I would never turn professional. I didn't believe in in uh, getting paid for what um, I was doing. But as you can tell today, I'm the former WBA junior welterweight champion of the world. And through the learning of boxing, I grew into a place of, of wanting to be the best. And through the amateurs, I went all the way to the Olympics, which was boycotted in 1984. Then we turned professional after they offered me some money to turn professional, and then I thought, well, might as well try it out. So then I set my goal to win the championship of the world before I was 25. And 27 days before my 25th birthday, I won the WBA championship from Johnny Bump City Bumpus knocked him out in the 11th round. So today I'm here just to try to help someone come to an understanding of how to set goals and reach those potentials in your life. Not necessarily to become a boxer, but to come to a place of confidence and faith in yourself and in the one that's created us because he has given us all good gifts to have. So how many amateur fights did you have before you turned pro? Josh, I, I never did really count up all my amateur fights. I probably fought from the age of 10 to the age of 21 as an amateur. I probably had 250 to 350 amateur fights as a, as a young man because we fought every weekend. Um, there growing up as a kid, we had boxing tournaments going every weekend, and, and it was a ongoing thing that, that, um, that they had us going through. And I didn't realize, at, you know, at that age, um, the hard work how it would pay off later on in life, but it, but it has, you know. I, I do see a, a good thing out of boxing. I can see some things in it that don't need to be uh, done, but I can also, find that there is a lot of good attributes to the boxing game that I learned about face setting goals and doing um, making myself come to a conditioning for my body's sake taking care of myself so with the um, amateur did, what kind of amateur time I know you, obviously you reached the pinnacle as a professional what, and you're gonna go to the Olympics what sort of amateur titles yeah did you win because you're from the, I've watched a lot of your videos. Mm -hmm. To me, your style looks more suited for a professional because you're not getting like you know you're not doing the little right. small point shots. You're right. you know, getting in there. Son of the gun out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, John, I'll take one. You know, I'll take I, three to give a good one type of guy, <laughs> Rocky Balboa. Well, that's kind of the the name that got stuck on me because of the size. I was always and had shorter reach for the, than most of the fighters. So I had to get inside to um, do the damage that I had to do. And, and, and a lot of times, a lot of the announcers would say that I was taking too many punches as I was uh, attacking my opponents, which I was always the stronger, seemed like, of the two because I was short and compact. Um, but I can see that, that growing up, I learned how to move my head with the punches so that I didn't take the solid blows like a head-on collision. A head-on collision, there's, that's where you really get hurt. And it's like a right hand running into the, the forehead of a person. But if you're moving to the right or to the left from a punch, then you're not taking that shot exactly on the, on the dead on position so it don't make the impact as like a head on. So I learned how to move my head, slide back and forth. I think that that has a lot to do with the training that I received growing up. I, I, uh, Who was had your some, trainer? Well, my father was my main trainer, but I had uh, James Busby, Eddie Parks, uh, Frankie Carr, and he ended up as my professional coach as uh, Joe Berentis, Betty Entis. Uh, Fort Worth. He was uh, my professional trainer that taught me the the slick movement inside uh, to get inside and then to be able to stay there without taking too much punishment. 
been able to give punishment when I was there. What? So tell me about the nickname Mad Dog. <laughs> well, I used to have a pit bulldog, right? And uh, I used to take him to the gym with me in the afternoons when I'd go work out, and I would chain him up in the corner. If you know anything about pit bulls, you need to keep them chained up or pinned up. They do not. Uh, they don't associate with other animals very good. And so I would put him in the corner. He was a great dog, loving dog, but he did not like me in the ring fighting. So when I was in the ring sparring, my dog would throw a fit over there, wanting to get off that chain to help his owner out. So somebody noticed the pit bull being uh, aggressive like that and my style being aggressive, so somebody called me one day a mad dog. And it stuck, so that's how I got that name from my pit bulldog named Popeye. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So, yep. what's um, what's the most what what's the toughest fight you've ever been in, in in boxing? I think I had quite a few tough fights. Um, Johnny Bump City Bumpus was a very good boxer. He was hard to uh, get down to bring him to a place where I could put some damage on him. Alfredo Escalera was uh, an ex-world champion of the WBC. I fought him twice, and, and in both fights, I won the first one, and the second one was real close, but he won in New York City. I think Alfredo Escalera probably was one of the toughest. Uh, Ubaldo Sacco from Italy, which, which I defended my title against, was uh, the same as Alfredo Escalera. Both of them were Spanish um, fighters, but they come to fight. When they were in the ring, they were there to do damage. And both Alfredo and es and uh, Ubaldo Saco was probably the toughest. I saw the. Uh, I watched the other day the Johnny Bumpus fight. Um, so it looked like initially he was kind of up by on points, but you kept coming forward. You, you stuck. So what? Kind of like someone that's a lot of people watch this and have been in the ring. So, right. what's your thought process there as it, you know, as it's coming? I mean, yeah. you talk about having faith and stuff. Did you right. know you had it in the bag if you just kept sticking to your game? Or? Well, well, of course, uh, faith has a lot to do with it. And I believe that this, the stronger faith that you have in the one that's created us, uh, the better off you are. And I think the confidence that comes from training very hard every day and building your wind up, your lungs up, your heart rate up, getting into the best shape that you can, build your confidence, which helps you reach the goal that you want to set. Well, I set my goal that I would win the championship before I was 25. Well, 27 days before that 25th birthday was my fight scheduled for Johnny Bump City Bumpus, and he was the next Sugar Ray Leonard, supposedly, in the boxing business. He was a razzle-dazzle. He was very good. I mean, very he was an good, amazing boxer. A very good boxer. He had the moves. He had the uh, the reach on his on me. He he was like six three, and so it was set up that the Mad Dog was going to take a loss in this. He was it was going to make Johnny Bump City Bumpus look good. And for the first eight seven to eight rounds. Johnny Bump City Bumpus did do, look good. He was out boxing the Mad Dog. But during that fight, he had uh, hit me with a, a cupped hand on the, on the ear in about the third round. And I did not know what happened except that it made me really dizzy. It popped something inside of my eardrum. And I went back to the corner and told my dad about it. He says, well, he stuck my finger, his fingers in my ear and says, all right, let's go. You know, because in the fight mentality, you know, you, you got to take those pains, those shots, and keep, keep going. Well, it took me four to five rounds to clear my head after Johnny had done that to my ear. And I found out when I got back to Fort Worth, I went to the ear doctor. He says, how did you stand up during the fight? And I said, well, I guess by the grace of God. He said, well, you got a busted eardrum. There is no way that you could have been stood up in that in that ring after that eardrum got busted. I said, well, <laughs> I'm proving I stood up through it. And I knocked him out in the 11th round. 
But after about the eighth or ninth round, I started getting my momentum back, and Johnny had gotten to a place where he was confident enough to stand in there and trade punches with me. Mistake. You don't trade punches the mad dog. Mistake. I started working his body, and then I just slipped underneath and threw a good left hook, which put put him on his face in the on in the ring. And his legs started jittering and everything else. He got back up before the count, but the fight ended hit there shortly after. You can see that video that Johnny on YouTube if you haven't seen it. Yeah, Johnny Bump City Bumpus uh, bit the dust, and he was upset. So was Lou Duva, and uh, I can understand being upset. And, and you know, today I can say, Johnny, man, I love you. We had a great fight, man, and uh, that gum. What can I say? I won. You know. Let's talk about some of the training for the fights because. Um Obviously, you had great conditioning if, if you're, right. regardless of the eardrum, if you're taking those kind of shots and right. you're able to put it, you know, together. So, like, what would a tip, when you're training for a fight, give me, like, a typical week of training well, know, in the fight camp when you're actually right. in the training camp would always start six to seven weeks before the actual fight itself. And it would start early in the morning. Uh, we would he head out on the road and, and at least hit six to seven miles a day. When you're training for a 15 round fight, which it was 15 rounds back in those days for a championship fight, you had to you had to run at least six to seven miles. And then I had, instead of walk, uh, getting in the vehicle after we run out six to seven miles, my trainer always followed, followed us just to protect us. I would jump on the 10-speed bicycle and ride it back. That was the little extra that I put into my training f for that particular championship That's cool. fight. So it's like a little like mental boost when you, it's, you know, yes, run every day. I did a little extra. I yeah. wanted to do a little bit extra. And I think that that goes to anyone's goal-setting plans. If you really want to reach your goal, do that little bit of extra that that comes to you in your mind and in your heart. Don't allow the negative part of it say, ah, don't worry about that little extra. Go ahead and do that little extra, and you'll find that it will build you to the place that you can achieve that goal that you're setting, that you've set reach. And I think that, that goes in boxing, that goes in weightlifting, that goes in uh, they come baseball, it goes in football, which I, I didn't mention my son being with the Padres. But he has learned how to set his goals this way, too. He grew up underneath me, and he fought one time. And he told me, after, he says, hey, Dad, I think I want to play baseball. And I said, well, son, let's do whatever you can do your best at. And that's what we want to do. And that's what I'm trying to get across here is that setting goals, whether you're a fighter or whether you're a golfer, a baseball, a ballerina, a cheerleader, it don't make no difference what you're setting your goals at setting your goals is the number one thing writing them down i think is another and then a, working to achieve them doing that little bit of extra that little bit of extra is going to make you reach that place that you're set your heart to reach so what did you look like to be so your goal setting strategies you set a goal write it down and then I'll, I mean the given as you're working for it but is that sort of what you did or yes sir okay. yes Josh I, I would do a lot of I did a lot of journaling when I was uh, in the competition of uh, boxing even in football even as a young athlete I learned how to write things down that I wanted to reach I wanted to reach certain things so I would get my own little secret spot nobody had to see what i wrote down except me and the one upstairs but i would write these things down about how i wanted to reach them or what i wanted to do to reach them and i think that has a lot a big asset in someone's life that if you're confident that you're going to do that the more you project yourself as achieving that the closer you are to reaching that goal 100 percent Yes. So, so let's get back to the training now. So you go six to seven miles in the morning. You ride your bike back. Yes. Then what, so what's the rest? That's early in the morning. That was like at five thirty-six in the morning. So what's the rest of the day? 
So uh, we come back, have our ex do our exercises. Always our set ups, push ups, the 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 body weight. I've always been. We had push ups and pull ups and and things of that nature. Um, we always did neck exercises also with a with a head band that would take pull our head down and we'd raise our head up and it would build our neck muscles and the jaw muscles. We do the same thing with our jaws. What's the jaw? Okay, yeah. Just just exercising your jaw would, would enhance just the muscles around your jawbone because your jawbone is connected to your equilibrium bone. And, and that, that, not the equilibrium bone, but the equilibrium. Yeah. And if your equilibrium is not strong, then you're going to, when you take a shot, you'll go, you'll go down. So that's, that's important if you're watching this, you're playing football or anything else. Right. Especially those next, next exercises, sort of funny people claim there's some expert in football training and they don't even work their neck. This is very, very Exactly. Important. I mean, in football, your neck is your most dangerous spot of the whole of the whole body because that's where your your headgear is and everything else. I think that that the neck ought to be exercised every day, especially for football, even baseball, because you're you're taking a chance on taking a shot with a baseball also. And I believe that they do at, at the camp at Justin's is work their neck all the time. And that's something that if you don't have your neck connected to your body very good, you're not going to walk too straight. Drive a car, you might get whiplash. You might get whiplash, right. <laughs> work your neck. So, yep. okay, you come back. So you go for the run. You come back and do the the strengthening exercises. Yeah, and okay. then there's breakfast. Then there's bre okay. You get your breakfast, your good breakfast, your good hearty breakfast, and then the rest of the day would be just nothing but resting until around two or three. Then we'd go back to the gym around three o'clock, 3.30. And that way we'd have that four, five, six hours in between working from the morning to the afternoon. And then we'd go into the training session, which would insist of about 15 rounds of boxing plus jumping rope and then at more exercises and then the rest of the day i would watch tv or rest how often would you spar the sparring was about every day during the training session depending upon your sparring partners and who all that you had to set up to spar in most cases, your sparring partners were paid, so they were there all the time. So you had to put in five to six rounds a day for sparring. And was it pretty hard sparring? or? or? Usually any time that you get in the ring, the competitive spirit is there. And with any men mm -hmm. and with any ladies, too, because <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you get into the... It's like running a race, you know. We, when we'd run morning four or five of us would take off to run five or six uh, miles well every day the champion of course had to try to hold the lead in order to set the pace but you got four or five guys that's also wanting to be a champion so they're pushing that competitive spirit as you're running so it's just like there is a competitive spirit with everybody when you go in groups or if you're training with people. And I think that is a big asset in reaching your goals to have someone kind of pushing you along in order to reach that goal. And how hard, okay, like, so looking back on that, what would you, if you're like advising people that are actually boxing now, not just doing it recreationally and hitting bags, do you think they should spar that hard? Should like take it a little easier? And how often should they spar? Like daily, a few times a week? Or well, Josh, um, this reason I'm starting this gym here, uh, it's called Fitness 413. It's here in Alito, Texas. <clears throat> this gym is going to be strictly on conditioning of the mind and the body and the, and, and the mental attitude of learning how to defend yourself with offense and defense without taking the shots in the head. I do have some head gears. I do have some spark gloves here, but I have no ring here. I'm not going to hold a boxing ring here because I'm not going to teach people to per se go hurt people. But I promise you, if you come to this class, I will teach you how to defend yourself. And if you have to hurt somebody, 
Well, it's time to hurt them. Well, if you act up, Gene will take you in the gravel in the back, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, well, no, it's, it, it's really a gym to set your, set your faith up and your confidence. And this is in Alito, Alito Texas. Alito, Texas. So we're, uh, for, if you're in the, the area, so that's um, from Fort Worth, you're about how far west? So. We're about 10 minutes west of uh, Fort Worth. It's on Interstate 20. You just take 1187 exit to the Lido and then take the first right, which is Bankhead, and then you go it down, follow it down to the second road, which is Bearcat Road, and then turn right, come down, and you'll see us on the left. My sign's out front. It says Fitness 413 Gym. We'd love to have you come by, check it out. And if you're interested, come on in here and get part of it. And we'll uh, we'll put in the, the um, description at the bottom of the video the contact information. So in, in case you didn't catch any of this, you can you can get in contact with Gene. Yes, sir. So I got my it, phone number and everything. Okay. What is your phone number if you're just watching it anyway? Eight one seven six five seven ninety nine fourteen. We have uh, kickboxing here. I ha I teach the boxing the the fight game. A uh, little elbow here and there, maybe a shoulder. Or <laughs> I can show you how to defend yourself. If you've not watched any of my videos, you can catch them on YouTube. And uh, oh, what's the the channel? Is it under your name or uh, just Gene Hatcher on YouTube? Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, either. very good. Yeah. So, have you um, now? It's talking about defending yourself. Have you ever had to use any of your boxing outside of the ring? As a young man, before I turned professional, I. I always seem to always find a good fight every once in a while <laughs> back in my younger days but uh, as, after I turned professional I never did have to use my fist anywhere else and and that's probably a good thing because people could have used them on me but um, you know use it against me because of the profession but Today, no, I, I, I walk with the confidence, and I believe that God in heaven has built me with a faith and confidence to know that there is no sense in fighting. There is other ways of getting things accomplished than fighting. And, and the, uh, the, the political side of life, because I was a politician for six years for the White Settlement. What? City, I was a can't, <laughs> I didn't know that. can't council councilman for the city of White Settlement, and I've learned how to um, negotiate and to uh, get across my point without being very vindictive at all. Good Lord has taught me this through His Word, and I believe that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is your greatest. Um, Weapon? Weapon. I, I, I hate to use weapon, but it is um, your greatest asset that a person can have because it gives you the love that it takes and the wisdom to live this life with character and with joy and with kindness in order to reach those goals that you want to. You're going to have to cross bridges, I found, in life that hurt. And if you don't learn how to deal with those pains in a civil and a in a godly way, you lose. I like to lose. I like to win. Well, let's just say, like hypothetically, there's no other way to avoid it. Would you? Would the boxing be valuable in a well, situation, or were you better off just going crazy? <laughs> well, like you're at the gas station at 3 a.m. Yeah, you know, some meth that attack is going to attack you with. Well, there's no way out. If there's no way out, then yes, your weapons are right here. But at the same time as uh, um, uh, anything like that would happen, you have to be trained to a place to be able to perceive it and to know that what's going down so that you can react at the proper time to save your family or yourself. And if those things happen, I can guarantee to get through those things perfect so are you um so that being said um so you're uh, are you you're not um getting you're not so you're, you're this is strictly your what you're doing now is for regular people for professional fighters right? josh I, i'm reaching I, i'm not reaching for the boxing uh uh individuals uh per se i mean if someone wants 
to have personal lessons mm -hmm. that is a boxer yes come on I'll show you some tips and some things that I've learned in the ring that can help you am I going to the ring with you no sir I want to help people live this life in a better way so that um, we're living in a, in a time today that you got to have some kind of defense. We are living in the day, but I hate to say it, it ain't just uh, love and be loved. Brother and sister, there's some criminals out there that are doing some crazy things today that you got to have some guns for. And that's what I want to help people come to a confidence that we can, we can live this life without that of what happens if this guy jumps me and I've got a, a lady kickboxer in here that's training ladies that can teach a woman how to defend herself if something like this happens you know I, I hate to say it but there's some idiots in our world today but there is ways to get through this without without being scared without walking with fear and having that faith and that confidence we want to teach you today let me ask you a couple questions actually about just back to boxing just because i think there are people watching this mm -hmm. that are actually like boxing beyond just you know the same sure. shape for defense i noticed one thing about your fights you seem to do real well is you had like a good ring generalship like you basically regardless even if you were getting hit you seem to take the person where you wanted them to go right was that instinctive or you had to learn that or like what's what's the deal on that like how did that kind of I, I, I believe that when you are uh, never let them see you sweat you ever heard that saying no, I like it though never let them see you sweat is uh, something that that was taught in my life uh, from my probably from my parents the good Lord uh, I believe that um, when you are confident in that you are going to reach that goal or when you're confident and sure assured of yourself that you can achieve what you set your goal at then you work at it as you believe it so like the lord said if you believe in me you will do these things well the same thing goes in this in this gym training that I'm trying to teach, if you're going to believe it, then we're going to act like it. And in the ring, like Josh was asking, uh, how I would move through the ring like I was in control, I never let them see me sweat, whether they were hitting me or not. That didn't stop my plan to get them before the, the fight was over. And in most cases, thank God, <laughs> I usually got most of them. Uh, there was, I think I had a, a record of 39 and 5 with 25 KOs. Um, some of them uh, I thought that I won on those five, but. So decisions. Decisions on the five, except for one, Lloyd Hunnigan knocked me out. I got Spain the Spain or something, right? Yeah, in Spain, I got the. Uh, and I'm proud of this. Can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Genesis World Book of Records shortest fight recorded as a championship fight of 41 seconds or 39 seconds. I I cannot remember, but supposedly I'm in the Genesis World Book of Records because Lord Hunnigan caught me with a right hand as I was throwing a left hand and his hit that quicker, that much quicker than mine did, which put me on the mat. And it was a good shot. Were you and prepared well for that fight? And it just it happened like I that? was prepared excellent for that okay. fight. I was I was ready for that fight, but like I said, sometimes, you know, those things are going to happen. In the ring, so, because that's a long time when you're talking like 15 rounds and you're in a championship fight, so, right. like, I'm not sure how to exactly ask this, so if you're going against somebody, obviously, if you get pissed off, that's not good, like, too much because you're going to tire yourself out. Right. So what's kind of your, like, so you, do you... Like, how do you view the person, like, you're fighting against? Is it, like, do you view them as, like, the enemy or just, like, a bag that's moving? Or, like, what's your thought process yeah. of the individual without so you don't tire yourself out? Because if, 
you're crazy like you didn't, you know, say it happened on the street, 30 seconds, it's over, you right. or whatever. Right. We're 45 minutes of fighting. 45 minutes of fighting. That's a long time. Right. So, like, how do you pace yourself and, and all that? And what do you, like, I guess, what's your, like, envisionment of the individual? Is it well, just like a silhouette you're punching at, or what are you thinking? Well, I, I believe, Josh, that if you do not prepare for the match before you get there, then you're not going to have the comp. And, yes, every fight that you're going to fight, every round of it, you have to be in the top shape that you can be in in order to compete that you like you want to. Not every round is going to go in your direction, but the confidence and the faith that you have already built up is going to carry you through. And this is in boxing, this is in school, this is in cheerleading, this is in uh, football, baseball, you're going to reach those times in your life where your body just wants to say, man, take it easy, take a rest, uh, take off next week, or don't run up that hill so hard. You're going you're gonna to face these negatives in your life that in boxing I learned as I was growing up that I had to defeat that negative voice or that self voice that says, you can't accomplish this. Yeah, well, you can accomplish it. You just got to push it aside and listen to the other voice in your mind and in your heart that says, work hard. Keep working at it. Keep trying. And then once you get to that kind of condition for the, for the match, when you're going through each round, whether it be 10 rounds, 12 rounds, or 15, 15 was the man's fight. They've changed that today. But, but the 15 rounds, I've even got in my corner before and said what round is it dad and and he would say well, it's eighth round and i said oh my lord i got eight more rounds or seven more rounds to go well those sort of negatives or down things that happen to us we either fight them or we give in to them and now i'm here to today to try to get you to get past those negatives in order to reach the goals that you want to get to. So it sounds like what you're saying is sort of like you created that, or you or anybody else doing this, you create a habit by always taking the so-called high road right. or the, the rough road, right. the harder one. The harder That's, one. That becomes your normal. So where you say, hey, I'm not going to do this today. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going I'm to take gonna get it bag, easy. Take it easy, take a round off, go yeah. home, whatever. That becomes your norm. So you got to, it comes down to a choice. Are you going to take the easy way or the hard way? If you take right. the hard way, it's not going to be so hard when you're in that tough exactly. situation. Exactly. When you build yourself up to the to that place of always being in stepping into the hard road or the higher road, then when you do run into the competition that that you're working towards, then it becomes easier like the ring. If I'm not prepared for that fight, there's no sense in getting in that ring. But if I'm prepared, I'm going to go in there with my best intent to to do my best and yes sometimes it's a win sometimes it's a lose let me also mention that a loss cannot be all bad because a loss shows you where you need to go to work i'm with you you know so that's good stuff so yes, sir. Uh, i think we covered quite a bit is there anything else you want to add i just appreciate josh giving me the opportunity to share with some friends out here and uh, if there's one thing I can tell you that builds faith in you more than anything else, that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And through Jesus Christ is how you can find that real joy that will keep you going to the next fight, the right. next competition. We appreciate it, Gene. So thanks, thank you Josh. very much. God bless.